talking about virtue, period. So while you can ask the question, what kind of woman are you, you can also ask the question, what kind of man are you, what kind of person are you, period. Last week, the Spirit of God came and He said to us, what kind of church is this? What kind of church is this? And today, He's asking another question, do you care? Do you care? And as he brought me to the scripture, I sat there and I said, God, I thank you. Chastening does not feel good. When you got chased, when you got whooped by your parents, at that time, you did not think they was loving you as a child. You, I mean, you know, you say you did wrong, but why, why, you know, and some, you know, sometimes the parents kind of got too hot. They were, they were a little hot. Sometimes they may have gotten away, when, you know, went on a little bit longer than they probably should have, but whatever. Chasing doesn't feel good. But one thing I do know about chasing, for the time when it doesn't feel good, it's the love of the person, the love of God in them and say, I'm going to correct you from this thing because the long run you can't see right now. But it's to deter you from a dangerous path. Chastening does not feel good. But it is done, especially when God does it, it's done for our profit. It is done because say, I want you to be with me. And if I let you continue to grow in this way that is not pleasing to me, you thinking you're right and you're not right. If I don't do this now, I got to do this. Receive it. I'm not doing it because I don't like you. I'm doing it because I love you. You don't, you don't understand it now, but you will. Just like how you can relate to your own childhood. Some things your parents did or did not do. You couldn't understand it then, but now you do. Some things you understand, now you do. I've been in the company of some people, and I hear and watch how they act, and I turn around and pick up the phone, and I thank my mom, thank you. When you couldn't catch me, you threw the shoe at me. Thank you for the switch. I meant it. Thank you. Thank you. It was rough. But I'm standing here today knowing how to be respectful, and as I give respect, I get respect. Knowing how to shut my mouth when I need to shut my mouth and speak when I need to speak. Knowing to walk away. Knowing that you, just because you are my lead, you're my elder in this leadership position, I mean, I agree with everything you do, but I just respect the fact that you're a leader. To be obedient. You know, I agree with everything, but to be obedient. Chastening is not always great. It doesn't, well, I shouldn't say not always great. It don't feel good. It don't feel good. But I've learned to appreciate God as I've learned to appreciate my parents and everybody else who had the liberty to whoop me because it wasn't just regulated to my mama. Hallelujah. The aunties and the uncles, hallelujah. You know, they got permission and authority <laughs> if, it's, if, it, if it was warranted. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So with that, I say this, and I got to say this, let him who have here to hear, hear what thus says the Lord. This morning God is talking about, do you care? Let's go to the book of Amos, chapter 2. The book of Amos, chapter 2, is an Old Testament book. For my youth who are sitting here looking very pretty, very wonderful, I'm going to ask you to step over to the side over there, get a Bible. Take time out. The ushers know where they're at. To, yeah, thank you. Those who have been here know where they're at. Step to the side. Get a Bible. Praise the Lord. Kids, I don't want you to just say, oh, what she said. <laughs> I want you to read this. The truth, Brother Franklin. Yeah. I know these are highly educated young people carry themselves with great poise. Mm -hmm. 
Your version of the Bible may sound a little bit different than mine. I'm reading out of the New King James Bible, and the version you got probably says King James. Go to the table of contents and find the book of Amos so you can find the page number. It's not one of those books that we often go to in church, but it's in the Old Testament, the book of Amos, looking at chapter 2. If your, book, if your Bible for some reason doesn't have a table of contents, look for, start off, uh, look for the book of Jeremiah. After that is Ezekiel. After that is Daniel, then Hosea, then Joel, then Amos. If you got to the book of Jonah, you went too far, go back. If you got to the book of Obadiah, Go back one more. The book of Amos. We're all there. Are we getting there? It's in the Old Testament. Help one another out. Book of Amos, chapter 2. Still looking? Okay. Book of Amos, chapter 2, starting off with verse 6. Remember, God is talking to us and asking us, Do you care? Thus says the Lord, For three transgression of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, I'm in verse 9, whose height was like the height of the cedars, that description is for the Amorites, and he was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. All this is talking about what God did to the Amorites. Verse 10, also it was I who brought you up, he's referring to Israel, I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorites. The Amorites are the people in verse 9 whom he drove out from before them. He uprooted them, he cut, cut them down. Amen? Verse 11. I was raised up, I, I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. It is, not, is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. Behold, I am weighed down by you as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. Verse 13 of Amos chapter 2. Behold, I am weighed down by you as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. Therefore, flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not strengthen his power, nor shall the mighty deliver himself. He shall not stand who handles the bow. The swift of foot shall not escape, nor shall he who rides a horse deliver himself. The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. When he brought me to this scripture earlier this week, I sat there and I said, I, I couldn't speak. My first reaction is trying to find a way to bargain with God. Because as I read it, in verse 6, he says, For three transgression of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. I will not turn away its punishment. I don't warn you time and time again. This is it. I said, Father, thank you. Why will he not turn away the punishment? They sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals and say, God, what are you saying? He said, righteous here is not just people who walk blameless and upright before God, but those who have a right cause. They have a case that is eligible to come before judges, God, judges, people whom God raised up to judge on his behalf. They have a case they can bring. They have an issue. They could bring to the elders, so to speak. 
However, the elders were acting in a corrupt manner. The elders were basically betraying them and said, if you give me, well, so-and-so gave me $50 and so-and-so gave me $1,000, I'm really going to hear so-and-so case because he paid me a little bit more. Two examples of folks being sold out, righteous people being sold, Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph just had a dream. God showed him in a dream, one day, I'm going to raise you up to be somebody. I'm not raising you to be somebody because I love you more. But I'm going to use you to save these people. I'm re Joseph didn't even really understand the dream. He just knew he was going to be in a position where his parents, his brothers and sisters going to be bound down to him. His brothers hated him from jump. Okay? Hated him from jump. Now, that's his daddy's fault. His brothers hated him from jump. Here, Joseph come and want to hang out with his brothers. His brothers said, we can't stand this joke. One of them wanted to kill him. And they said, no, let's just sell him. Just sell him. And tell the father, you know, he died somewhere out there. Joseph didn't do his brothers nothing. Except told him, this is the dream. Irritated them, and they got upset. Joker, we're going to do away with you. That's enough. Another example in the New Testament, Jesus. Tell me what wrong did Jesus do? All he did was preach the word. Show love. That's all he did. That was his purpose. To fulfill the scriptures to show the word. So this is how God said we should be living. You're getting caught up in the little itty bitty stuff. You're getting caught up in traditions of men. That's not God. The way you matter is to love God more. To love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus got sold. The third piece of silver. Why? Can't stand him. Can't catch him in nothing. Can't stand him. Today, some of us get pushed aside, and some of us are pushing people aside. Favoritism. You may not get bling, you may not get money, but somebody's going to do you this favor. Somebody's been here a little bit longer. Somebody run with you a couple extra miles. Somebody do this, somebody do that. I don't care if it's in the church, outside the church. I'm talking about, I don't care if it's Sunday morning or it's Tuesday morning or Saturday morning or whichever day it is. God is not liking the favoritism. He's not liking the greed and he's not liking the betrayal. Amen? They pant after the dust of the earth which is on the head of the poor and pervert the way of the humble. What is he saying? The pant after the dust of the earth, the pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor. They pervert the way of the humble. These folks are not getting true justice. Why? Because they're not kissing up to so and so. They're not brown nosing. Either they're not browsing at all, brown nosing at all, or brown nosing right. Or whatever it is they aren't doing, they're going the extra, let me butter your toast or you. Not doing a little extra something, something. So you can, you know, look at me. I mean, I've seen it on my job. We're jumping through hoops, all kind of hoops. And then they get overlooked. And look at you funny. Because all you did was to please God, do your job, love everybody, and then you get promoted. You may have suffered a little bit longer. You may have been passed over 16 times. But when you got elevated, you got elevated, and all of a sudden everybody hating on you. Because you ain't never buttoned nobody toast. Never poured them no coffee. God is hating. God is not liking folks who stand in the way of the humble. Humble doesn't mean just the moral humility. It may be you have, you're in a lowly position. You're not the president. You're the maintenance guy. You're the maintenance person. You're not the head chef. You're the one that just cut the vegetables. You don't even get to design the little stuff in the vegetables. You just get to cut it straight and that's it. You don't have a lofty position in the church. You come in, you praise the Lord, you're just here. That's it. You sit on the bench. You ain't been called to do nothing much. But you get overlooked. You don't get treated right. Because you're not somebody. Or you don't treat somebody right. Because they're not somebody. God is not for it. 
Amen? Then verse 8. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. Exodus chapter 22, verse 26 through 27 gave Israel permission to take clothes in pledge. In other words, if I loaned you something, I could take your coat, your cloak as collateral till you pay me back on that loan. But what it says in the scripture is that at the end of the day, even though I may not have paid you, even though you may not have paid me back, I ought to give you your cloak back. So when you go to bed, you're not cold. See what I'm saying? God said, okay, Sister Drew lent me $50. Sister Drew can take as collateral on my coat. Okay, fine. When the sun goes down, Sister Drew ought to be giving me back my coat. It's what I got to sleep in. It's my little covering. Right? I'm dirt poor. I got to go borrow some money from Sister Drew. These people were acting foul. They were actually flagrantly, blatantly disobeying God. And said, no, I ain't going to give you your coat back. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go before God and worship anyhow. Act like I ain't done nothing wrong. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. He's not liking folks preaching and teaching the word and not doing it. Have the nerve to tell you what does this law, what the scripture says. But don't even try to do it. Last week he asked us what kind of church is this? What kind of church this is, it is this? And we saw great examples. Great examples of where folks had an opportunity to do right. But because, for whatever reason, their flesh wasn't satisfied, they're going to get upset and get and act out. He's not liking this. So what is God saying? Well, I remember sitting down, and before all this, the revelation of what, you know, verses 6 through 8 came to me. Before God led me to it, the first thing I thought was, what came to my mind was that pot that was on for the longest time here in faith mission. And I said, Lord, this time, because what he said to me, he said, I'm angry. He's angry. And he's going to execute judgment. He's angry. And he's going to execute judgment. Verses 9 through 12, God is reminding Israel Look, this is me and what I did for you. A people who didn't know, a people who were stronger than you, by the way. You couldn't handle it by yourself, by the way. I chopped off the head, I took up the root. I wiped them off before you. I gave you the stuff. I gave you the land. I did this. You couldn't do this. You didn't have the strength to do this. I did this for you. I raised up your prophets. And some of them are y'all called the prophets so that I speak through them so that you can hear me. Some of them were Nazarites. These Nazarites are people who took a vow to God, personal vow to God, so we're not going to eat anything made from grapes. Personal vow to God. Now, if you want to know about vows, I highly encourage you to read Numbers chapter 30, especially us women. Numbers chapter 30, verse 1, talks about you make a vow before God, he expects you to pay. That's for the men. The rest of the scripture talking about it's helping the women out. <laughs> but I, I highly, strongly encourage you to read that. God take vows seriously. A lot of us are stuck where we're at right now because of some things we just said, Lord, if you, or you promised some things, and he waited for the if you. No, I'm sorry, let me take that back. He did the if you. He waiting for, I will. What do you say you do after you will? He's waiting for that part. I try to remember every day, Lord, what else I was going to do? I do. Because I understand I may be hanging my own self based on what came out of my own mouth. Some things were said in the heat of the moment. God know what said in the heat of the moment. But do he release me? Not necessarily. Still going, that's why, you know, say it's better to not make a vow than to make one and not pay it. 
That's why he said be quick to listen, slow to respond. The other day he said don't let emotions move you out of character. You're feeling the pressure, you're feeling the heat. Ah! Sometimes it's better to hold on in the pressure, hold on in the heat. And, you know, say, just say Jesus and let him come. You'll be able to bear it. You will. Try not to make no right. I, before I'm learning now, before I make any more promises, think about that long list you got. Don't add to it no more. Don't add to it no more. Get, get, get those under. There may be some I add to, but don't be so quick to be adding and racking it up, man. It's like, ooh, pause. All right? But God is saying, let me put you in remembrance that this is me. Verse 13 is key. This is what he said to me. Verse 13 is key. Behold, I'm weighed down by you. As a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. In other words, you are on my nerves. Get off. Before he showed this to me, I was just thinking about this. I said, you know, when you're carrying somebody as a heavy burden, you just want them off. Just want them. Get off of me. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to carry all this junk on me. You with all your issues, with all your strife, with all your stuff. It's not to say I don't love you anymore, but I can't hang with you with all that stuff. Jesus said, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. You added extra, extra stuff just because you feel like being honored. You don't want to be obedient. Get off of me. I listened to the message where it says, you know, shake it off. Shake off the dust and pack it up under your feet. You let dust collect on you before you know it becomes this sticky thing where you got to scrub and scrub and scrub and try to get it off. Now, listen. Listen. I understand everybody is at their various stages of growth. And I'm learning to be patient because I have to be patient with myself and somebody had to be patient with me. I also need you to understand, if I step aside so you can work your stuff out, I'm stepping aside so you can work your stuff out because I'm not going to carry the junk you're trying to hold on to. If you don't want to believe me and say, you know, cast your cares on Jesus, fine, carry your stuff. But there ain't no reason for me to carry your sin with you. And that's what this is what God's saying. I ain't going to carry you with all this junk you got. I'm not going to hold on. Do you care? Do you care about people? Do you care about your fellow man? Do you care when you see people not getting justice? Do you care that if somebody has a right case, a right cause, you ignore them and you don't address this issue, you don't address that? Do you care? Let him that have ears to hear, hear what thus says the Lord. If this ain't for you, bless God and pray for somebody. If it is for you, hear what thus says the Lord. That's what that means. That him that have here, hear what thus says the Lord. Behold, I'm weighed down by you as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. This is when he told me I'm angry. I'm going to execute justice. The rest of it is just basically saying flight shall perish from the swift. Strong, the strong shall not strengthen in his power. If you want to fast runners, you're going to find you can't be moving as quick no more. If you strong and mighty, you don't have the strength no more. If you if you were able to handle a bow and you can fight all these kind of battles and do all these kind of things, you can hold a gun, wield a knife, you're not going to be able to have it to do it anymore. You can't stand to do that anymore. Why? You're still up in God's face foul. The strength you once had to fight is not there anymore. Because you're offending the Father in heaven. You're doing things you think is right. Perverting the way of the humble. Being a stumbling block to somebody who's trying. And he's saying, forget you. You're a weight on me. I'll carry this. I have to remind myself, God says, I will draw near to the humble. I resist the proud. He didn't say, I don't love you. Note that. He never said he loved the whole world. But he ain't going to hang and roll around with you if you're a mess. Think back and go back over your life. Jacked up, tore up, you know the Lord was somewhere, but he wasn't hanging out with you. 
somebody else was praying for you. And he said, okay, I'm going to hear your prayer and show a little grace and mercy. But he showed up one rolling around with you. Shaking it off. I saw this and this encouraged me. Not to get too off talk. This, get off, this encouraged me. I said, no, I said, why? He said, shake the dust off. All of this excess junk. If you care about somebody, if you care about something, it's like, I'm not going to hang with you if you're going to act foul. I still love you. But if you determine, if you're determined, hear me, I'm not saying you have a stumbling moment, you're hot right now, can't see right now, all kind of dust in your eye. Now the dust is gone, you repent and you get back up on your feet and come in your righteous mind. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about even after you know the word and you have the nerve to still teach the word and speak the word, but you determine that you're still going to come up in the house of God or go before God, period. You don't have to come to faith mission. You don't have to come to 109, 1009, flower block, drop. You determined that you're going to still carry this hate. You determine you will still carry this unforgiveness in your heart. But still praise God and carry on as if it's like, Lord, you just know my heart. I'm still going anyhow. Even though you know the word back and forth can quote scripture from Genesis to Revelation. I'm through with it. Psalm 1 says, let me read it. Psalm 1 says, we talked about that a little bit last week. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seats of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it does he meditate day and night. Blessed am I if I'm obedient to God, loving God, and not be a hindrance to somebody who's watching me. Who's saying, well, I told, I love Jesus, I'm a follower of Christ. Not being a hindrance to them by saying one thing and doing something else. Blessed are you if you do that. When God said, you know, cut some people off, seek him, and that's what I need to do. Because some people are hindering us from growing, from getting to the point that we need to be. Where you know you need to be. Now, let me say this, because I said this earlier. I got to read this. He said it's mandatory. I need everybody with me to go to the New Testament. Go to the book of Hebrews. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. I'm not going to stand before you too long. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. What he's showing us in Amos, he said, I will execute judgment. The other day, I was getting ready to pray. Call out some names. And he brought me to the book of Jeremiah. You go to the book of Hebrews, I'm just talking. He brought me to the book of Jeremiah before I started praying. So no go to the Bible, go to the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah 14:11 he said, "Do not pray for these people for their good." I said, "Okay." I've always said, I've learned to walk in the love of Christ. That it don't matter what you think about me, it don't even matter what you're going through. It don't matter how bad you is, how terrible you are, be me or somebody else. I wouldn't want anybody to have to suffer the wrath of God. The love of Christ is in me such, I wouldn't want anybody. That's why God be waking us sometimes, or pausing us in the middle of whatever we're doing, and laying some names on our hearts. They acting up. They acting out. They crossing the line. You're somebody whose hands are clean, your heart is pure. And he's calling your spirit to stand in the gap for this person. I'm moved by compassion to help them. But I can't do it until you utter something into the earth room for the angels to move. That's what prayer is. When you speak it out, you're causing God to move. It's not like he's ignorant of some things. 
but he set this up where he's going to work through us whom he created to stand in the gap. The, the scripture talks about his eyes is Roman 2 and 4 looking for somebody to stand in the gap. Some days when you know brother so-and-so hates your guts, brother so-and-so did you wrong, but God's given you the opportunity to be a blessing to brother so-and-so and say, I don't want you to end up like them. Stand and pray for them. They're overtaken in the fault. You don't know that right now. Are you even trying to consider that right now? Pray for them. Right? But when he brings me to that scripture, when he tells me don't pray for them, I realize I have to love and respect God enough to where I don't try to pray for somebody. He just told me don't pray for their good. It's not to say that God hates them. It's to say, say now, now this is my issue. I'm going to deal with this one-on-one -on -one with them. Somebody was praying for Paul, you know, while he was around, going around killing, p killing folks before he became Paul, when he was still Saul, and thinking all he was doing was for the glory of God, not wanting to receive Jesus Christ. Somebody was praying for him. And then God knocked him down and said, look at his son. You're kicking against the ghost. I have purpose for you. Took him aside. So I have to respect God when he said, don't pray for their good no more. To know that God's got this me and this person one on one. But we go to the book of Hebrews. Because in Amos we saw where God says, I am not going to turn away the punishment this time. I'm not. But what we talked about this morning in Sunday school, I ha it has to be brought up again, is that there is a challenge for us in the body of Christ to receive chastening, to equate chastening of God with the love of God. There's a huge challenge for us in the body of Christ to think that when God chastens us that he actually does love us. Why is that? childhood associations we think if we get whooped oh no let me put it this way a lot of us have been taught that if you love me you will do X you will do Y you will do Z you will never hurt me whoopings hurt grounding me don't feel right amen taking away my privileges does not feel right doesn't make me feel happy so I start to question, do you truly love me? Because that's what I associate love with. A lot of us, I'm not saying everybody, a lot of us have been taught that this is what love is. Love never hurts you. Love always makes you feel uchiku and feel good. And so you come into the body of Christ on this emotional roller coaster of what love is. You have to learn after a while that love is actually a decision. You make up your mind that you're going to love somebody in spite, regardless. That's what God did. When he said, I so love the world, he didn't look at our sin to say, you know, but. He said, I love you nonetheless. I want to hang with you when you're acting foul, but I still love you. I still have somebody to stand in the gap for you. I will still take time out to correct you because I love you. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 5. Again, I'm coming out of the New King James Version of the Bible. I'm hoping the young people are there with me and reading with me. In their right, Sister Deja. You're sharing the Bible with your sister next to you, right? And you have forgotten, thank you very much, and you have forgotten, the, I'm serious, I don't want you all to say she said. I want you to see with your own eyes. It's something powerful when you see with your own eyes and hear. It's not to put anybody out. But you're, none of us is exempt from the word of God. Amen? And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as the sons. It says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom he loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. 
whom he loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. I believe the King James calls them bastards, right? Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seems best to them, but he, God, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. The chastening is for our profit, so that what we've been talking about, Lord, I want to reign with you, Lord, I want to be with you, I want to get to heaven, is so that we do walk in holiness here on earth. Practice it. <laughs> Practice it. Verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, 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 afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What does the King James say? Who have been what? What does verse uh, uh, 11 King James say? Somebody read it. exercise trained by it. If you have a pet at home, a dog for a sec, in order for the dog to obey you, there are times when you will reward the dog and there are times when you will chase that dog to let that dog know, no, you don't do that. And as the dog gets older or more accustomed to you, there's some things that the dog will do and folks will come around and marvel and say, ooh, you just have to do this and he just did that. There are people who have kids who have trained their kids at home with the rod and with the staff, hallelujah, have kissed the little behinds. Praise be to God. Amen. So when they do go out and they don't act, like, oh, your children act good because it was a lot of stuff that was happening at home. I make sure you ain't going to come out in public and do that. That ain't right. You ain't going to embarrass me like that. That's not how we do it. It takes time. This is God. God is saying, I'm going to help you all I'm angry. Your junk is like, wait, I don't care this way. I'm shaking it off. But in the meantime, I'm going to correct. I'm going to do correction. But understand the correction that I'm doing is for your profit. It ain't for, it's for our profit. For our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. God will be holy still. Whether we make it to heaven or not, God will be holy still. Whether we praise and worship or not, he will be holy still. If we don't do it, the scripture says he will raise up the rocks to cry out to him. He will be holy still. This is the same God who can wipe off the face of the earth, but because he made a vow, he made a promise, that I ain't going to do this like that no more. But we know he does have the power to wash it all off and start from again, from scratch, do the dust, and start again. But he said, no, that's not what I want. That's not what I intended. Verse 12, Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And verse 13, And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. Sin does not strengthen us. It weakens us. It chips away at stuff. And when God comes in, start to crumble up all Jesus. Set yourself up. Set yourself up. Now, God didn't tell me to specify here that I was trying to look for some, give me some specifics, Lord, some specifics. No, I'm chasing. Let him who have here to hear, hear what thus says the Lord. If you're doing right, praise God. I tell you what my attitude was when I heard this. I sat down and I said, thank you, Lord. 
before he brought me to the scripture, I said, thank you, Lord. I'm going to tell you why I said, thank you, Lord. Because I remember what the scripture says. That you care enough about me to correct me, to chasten me. You love me so much that you want me to be with you. And you're letting me know this that you're doing, you can no longer do. I'm going to help you remember this that you're continually doing. Every day you get to talk about you repenting about it. I'm going to help you so that you remember. Stay repentant and don't go back. I'm reminded of the Hebrew boys. Everybody love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. Praise God. When God said all of Israel is going into captivity, whether you're right or you're not right, nothing was wrong with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were loving God. But the whole nation was going into captivity. The whole nation. I look at them and I say to myself, God, I can't think of... You tell me I'm in a... I can't think of... There's something you're going to correct in each and every single one of us. And I want to encourage you, do not let the enemy bring fear to you. Ungodly fear. To where you start sweating, thinking, oh my God, oh my... No, 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 no. Start thanking God. Do what you can. Hear what he said. Receive. This is this is so, so, so important. So important. If God should so choose to use Brother Franklin to chasten you, to rebuke you, please have an ear to hear the voice of God and receive the man of God as he comes to you. i tell you why this is so important. A lot of us in the body of Christ right now are jacked up because we cannot receive correction. Oh, you don't know me because you said to me, excuse you. A lot of us right now, we can't even step to folks and say, let me, because I know what you're doing is wrong. The spirit, I'm being pressed my spirit to let, let me say, in the spirit of meekness, I'm coming to you. Can't come to you because you're so consistently rejecting, rejecting, rejecting. Now, if I read the scripture right, and Bible scholars can help me out, after a while, when you do the constant rejecting, God goes, well, fuck, whatever. He is. He's like, okay, fine. You think you're right. You notice here in the scriptures he says, in verse 6 he says, for whom, of Hebrews 12, verse 6 he says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If God ain't chastening you, he don't gave you over to a rip of big mind. You feel you all that, you don't ever want to change. We saw in the scriptures where Jezebel had an opportunity, Cain, let's talk about last week, that's closer. Cain had an opportunity to repent. But he didn't choose to. Fine. You don't want to receive me, I'm going to let you go. Their judgment come, we're going to, yeah. You're not going to be with me. That's what happened with Satan. <laughs> it's like, I oh, know, I want your spot. That's what I want. You have to look <laughs> Uh, two heads is a freak. I am over you. You know, I made you. You're not gonna raise up and say you want to be over me when I make get out. That's what he's saying with this way. Get off. Get off. Get off. I ain't telling y'all to load. Get off. But I'm gonna help you to remind you and to let you know. This is what I called you to to holiness, to righteousness. This is who I am. You say you believe me. You say you love me. You say you receive me. Let me remind you how I walk, how I talk, how I live, how I move, how I be. You say you're a follower of me. Let me help reinforce some things in you. I pray, I pray, I pray, because I know I'm not, I'm not going to fault God. He'll do his part. The part that makes it seem like he ain't doing his part is when we ain't receiving it and walking it out. That's the part. That's the part. 
That's the part. No, what that happened? That ha but after a while, man, it was a, I mean, it was a long while, but it was still after a while. Stuff started happening. And my sister started breaking down in her spirit. And what she was holding on to so desperately as justification for the continued unforgiveness, she finally let it go. Girl, I could pray now. I could pray. I mean, when that stuff happened, man, oh, Lord, I was hollering. I was wailing. Listen, why was I wailing? Because finally, it's like, I finally, the love of Christ is such. When God's love is abiding in you and you abide in the love of Christ, you will sincerely love your neighbor, your brother and sister in Christ. You don't want to see them overtaken in a fall. You want to pray. You want to offer a word. Whether it be a word to encourage or a word to rebuke, say, come on, get it right. Whatever it may be, you want to offer a sincere word, a word from the Lord. You want to help. Why? Because you know what it's like to be foul. You remember what it's like to be foul, and now you are abiding in Christ. Man, who don't want everybody to be a partaker of this? This is not exclusive to me. It's not exclusive to you. It's like going to a restaurant. It's like, man, you got to come over here. You got to see this movie. You want to share this. That's the love of Christ. But we seem to have issues with the correction part. Some of us give up on God. Give up on God. Just can't believe God will let this happen. <laughs> let me not get this. In. Let me lose that. Can't, can't believe that's the love of God working to help me stay holy and righteous. You know, just be binding up the devil, you know, binding up stuff and trying to bind God up. Do you care? Do you care? Let's stand to our feet.